the 1960s in particular started to sound the death knell of traditional Campbellian science fiction and the counterculture emerging in this period, especially through the American universities, embraced three books in particular. One was The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's high fantasy epic. The other two were deeply influential science fiction novels, namely Robert A. Heinlein's Hugo Award winning Stranger in a Strange Land and Frank Herbert's Dune. These works of importance are of particular relevance to the social upheaval going on in America, which would be a decade that saw some of science fiction's greatest dreams realised, especially with the moon landing in 1969. All three works have a number of similar themes, and all are quite impressive in their scope. They share ecological themes, June more so than the others, which captured the imagination of the university underground, and some have claimed even helped to spark the development of the growing ecological movement in the 60s. They also include strong messianic tendencies, though The Lord of the Rings has without a doubt the least flamboyant and imposing saviour of the three novels. Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land became almost a bible for the counterculture, some of its ideas even becoming notoriously embraced by Charles Manson's family. The books also shared an interest in water related themes and concepts, water often having a cleansing effect capable of defeating the evils of Middle Earth in Tolkien's trilogy. The Nazgul are, for example, first defeated by the river at the Ford of Bruin, where it swallows them up consuming their steeds, and the armies of Saruman at Isengard are defeated by the Ents unblocking a dam and flooding the place. Water also becomes the focus of the religion of Valentine Smith in Heinlein's novel, Charles Manson's family famously copying the water rituals from the book. In Dune, water is the essence of survival, and its importance is monumental on the planet Arrakis. The 1960s also saw the emergence of a revolt across the Atlantic, where back in Great Britain the new wave of science fiction was beginning to emerge. From the period of the early 60s up until the early 70s arose the new wave of science fiction. It was most notably a very, though not exclusively, British reinvention of the traditional American pulp science fiction of the Golden Age. The new wave of the 60s took its name from the Nouvelle Vague movement of French cinema from the late 1950s to early 60s, and was most notably characterised by filmmakers such as Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard. The new wave represented a sharp swing away from Campbellian science fiction, and the upbeat conservative material produced in magazines in the United States of America, which up until this time were dominating the field. In particular, the new wave of science fiction would still carry on the magazine tradition, though at this point, science fiction writers were successfully selling their novels outside of the magazine environment. In Britain, however, it was New World's magazine, under the editorial leadership of Michael Murcock, that would come to represent the new wave as a whole. Its writers, along with Murcock, included the likes of J.G. Ballard, Thomas M. Dish, Brian Aldiss, John Clute, Harlan Ellison, and Samuel Delaney to name but a few. In America Harlan Ellison's dangerous visions also had significant impact, but the new wave belonged mostly to British writers. American writers would often use the vehicle of New Worlds to publish work that was seen as unpalatable to the American publishing houses and magazines. As a literary force, the New Wave was not localised to the United Kingdom, but as a publishing phenomenon, Great Britain would be its home. In saying this, New Worlds was itself not a product of the late 60s and early 70s, having had its first publication way back in 1946. Plans had existed to publish it beforehand, but World War II intervened and put it on hold for a while, as a number of its potential early writers entered the war effort. However the magazine did not truly emerge with its new ethos until the early 1960s, when Murcock declared its intent to publish work by both new and established authors which could not find a home anywhere else. Murcock was primarily a fantasy writer as opposed to science fiction at the time, and had himself published in New Worlds and Science Fantasy which under the earlier editorship of John Carnell, had been publishing work that he felt should be well written and have ambitious themes. Murcock himself believed that it was in science fantasy that some of the first new wave material appeared in the late 50s. Murcock began working as editor for New Worlds in 1964, following the purchase of the magazine and its sister product Science Fantasy in 
by David Warburton of Robertson Vinter, and the subsequent retirement of John Carnell. New Worlds, along with its various other sister publications, had found themselves struggling under bad sales and circulation during the early 1960s, and it was Warburton who stepped in to purchase both magazines from Nova Publications, the magazine's previous owners. Roberts and Vinter were looking to break into a more established, literary and respectable form of publishing, having previously published adult magazines, and felt that these products were perfect, bringing on board Chiral Bonfiglioli as editor for Science Fantasy and a 23-year-old Murcock for New Worlds. Writers and artists severely dissatisfied with the way science fiction had been developing in the USA, and who wanted to produce experimental work would find a home at New Worlds, and over the next few years would produce some of the most unorthodox and experimental science fiction that was quite contrary to the established mode of Campbellian science fiction across the Atlantic. As Murcock wrote, it would specialise in experimental work by Burroughs and artists like Paul Lozzi, but it would be popular. It would seek to publicise such experimenters. It would publish all those writers who have become demoralised by a lack of sympathetic publishers and by baffled critics. It would attempt a cross-fertilisation of popular science fiction, science, and the work of the literary and artistic avant-garde. The new wave held a particular distaste for the American pulp science fiction era, typified by the ideas spearheaded by John W. Campbell, but in addition to this, it also wanted to see a new mode of science fiction literary criticism, especially other than that presented by the likes of Kingsley Amos. Murcock's continuing disgust at what he saw as almost a death knell of science fiction from the USA was often vocally and publicly made apparent, as was his loathing of Amos's work. As he pointed out once, science fiction has gone to hell, and Kingsley Amos is mapping it. I believe that we needed more rigorous criticism to seek definitions of the forms we were working in, since we were all somewhat confused. I find, for instance, the science fiction criticism of Amos, Crispin and Conquest condescending, fatuous and weary, characterised by a kind of hearty complacency and defiant philistinism, it had a blousy air to it, it was no better than the pieties of Sunday newspaper lead reviewers which had in common the atmosphere of the social club, the saloon bar, the locker room. The new wave was rebelling against what it saw as unimaginative, badly written and conservative mainstream work, which was more often than not trying to inform this new generation of writers how to go about their business. In that sense, the new wave was not only developing its stylistic and thematic elements through their own sense of innovation, but also through their strong reactionary and almost hostile dislike for the very kind of fiction in this milieu that they despise so openly. The likes of Robert Conquest, Edmund Crispin and Kingsley Amis were seen to be openly condescending, urging that science fiction was a genre and its writers should accept the limitations of it as such. It was shocking to be condescended to by Robert Conquest, to be taken aside by Edmund Crispin and told over some gin or other that all our ideas had been tried and found wanting in the 1920s, that the appeal of the science fiction genre was that it was a genre fulfilling like the mystery story certain acceptable genre expectations. Amos with his lazy paradoxes reviewed the first issue of New Worlds We Produced by referring to Burroughs as not the far more interesting and imaginative Edgar Rice, but the boring William. The new wave in fact relished the works of William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, Jacques Kerouac, and in particular Mervyn Peake. As it began to make its mark on the genre, it found that it was in fact alienating some of its older audience, while at the same time attracting a new readership. The American Campbellian old guard, the likes of Conquest, Crispin and Amos, as well as the likes of Brian Aldiss, were openly critical of the magazine's content, although others such as Judith Merrill would provide much praise for the magazine. New Worlds would ultimately see a rejection of the technocratic forms of American science fiction, moving away from the rocket ships, H-bombs, laser guns and supermen that so typified the Golden Age era, to produce a more inward-looking, reflective form of science fiction which would be better termed as speculative fiction rather than science fiction. It was J. G. Ballard, 
whose work was seen as the backbone of New Worlds by Murcock and one of the guiding lights of the New Wave, who typified this idea, in that he firmly believed that science fiction needed to turn away from outer space and look to the inner space of the human psyche. The 70s would begin as typically downbeat in science fiction, with again films and literature depicting disastrous futures and ecological nightmares. The end of the 70s would also see a surge in the big budget science fiction movie, culminating with the likes of Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Wars. These films were also attempts to get away from the downbeat negativism pervading the general consciousness, especially in the United States following the end of the Vietnam War. Science fiction movies would begin at this point to more and more shape the public's perception of science fiction, increasingly requiring excessively extravagant budgets to push the envelope on what is technically possible in the medium. The huge canvas created in the cinema was the antithesis to what the new wave was trying to achieve in its literature. I believe this was very much responsible for the turning away from the inner space concepts of that particular time and creating a resurgence in the general public's mind for huge concepts science fiction in outer space. Frank Herbert's Dune series can be viewed as both a product of the latter days of the golden age of science fiction, and a work in a similar subversive mode of the new wave that followed. But in saying that he is part of the new wave would be remiss, as I feel his influence, especially that of Dune, was the spur that set this new tradition on its way with a newfound confidence. It is safe to say that as a science fiction writer, or even a writer of any kind, Frank Herbert's work is a careful melange of influences, themes and directions, making him notably unique in the genre, being a man of two worlds. It is for this reason that his work has remained steadfastly popular and critically acclaimed. Having presented this brief discussion on the golden age and the new wave of science fiction, we can firmly put Frank Herbert in his correct place and time. Beginning his tenure as a science fiction writer towards the mid-50s, although having published prior to this, it was really the early to mid-1960s that began to see his influence grow. The impact of his other works will perhaps unjustly remain in the shadow of Dune and its successors, which were written over a period of 20 years. Brian Aldiss viewed H.G. Wells as being set apart from those writers occupied in a similar mode, and I believe Herbert's Dune series has such an identifiable position in science fiction history. It stands apart from the Golden Age, and cannot really be identified with the new wave which is often regarded in a very British light. Dune in particular is a subversive work which gripped the same imagination that the rising ecological movement and spirit of inhibition and individualism maintained on the counterculture of the 1960s. Science fiction is to a certain extent reinventing itself with Dune, turning its back on a stagnation that had developed out of a once prosperous and innovative golden age in America. It looked to older and more inquisitive times for its influence and recaptured the literary achievements of Victorian science fiction as it turned its back upon the mass-produced efforts of its contemporaries. As Frank Herbert says in June when introducing Paul Atreides, we should take the most special care that you locate Moadib in his place. This too we must do with Frank Herbert, for although we know he was born in Tacoma, Washington, like his hero Paul, Arrakis, the planet known as June, is forever his place. <laughs>